Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's book launch. I'm delighted to be opening this celebratory event. Uh, we're part of a community in the school where we are often cheering each other on to complete big projects, and it's wonderful today for us to be celebrating the completion, the monumental completion uh, of a major project with the launch of a new book, English Landscapes and Identities, Investigating Landscape Change from 1500 BC to AD 1086, published by Oxford University Press. This is a special book in many ways. It's a piece of truly archeological teamwork, nine, 10 archeologists with complementary skills and interests working together towards a very delayed return goal. It is also a collaboration with an artist, Miranda Creswell, who's with us here today as well. Uh, Miranda worked with the team on themes like connections and her work graces the book's cover and uh, in some of its inner pages as well. So this collective effort was led by Professor Chris Gosden and in such a way that Chris has a particular talent for that each person's voice and unique contribution could be developed as well as contributing to that collective goal. The timing of this book's launch is also noteworthy because it comes at a moment in the UK academic landscape when the case for archaeology, including the vital role of developer-funded fieldwork, needs to be made and needs to be heard. Archaeology is virtually unique in the way that it spans the humanities, social, and hard sciences, from art to isotopes and everything in between. And this new book is a fantastic testament to archaeology's potential to bring us all together. So above all, congratulations to the Inglade team who are arrayed before us on their Zoom screens today. And I'm delighted now to hand over to Chris Gosden. Thank you very much indeed, Amy, for such a, a generous introduction. Um, and welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, just to say, before I start saying anything, we are very happy to entertain questions. Um, so if you'd like to ask us a question, which we'll, we'll attempt to answer at the end, um, if you can put those in the chat function, that would be great. So the English Landscapes and Identities Project, which is often known by its acronym Englade, um, looked at the period from 1500 BC to AD 1086. Uh, 1500 BC is the start of the Middle Bronze Age and is more or less the start of the settled landscape in, in England, um, where field systems, trackway, settlements and so on were, were laid out. And that was our starting point. And we ended with the first great document of, of the English landscape, which is Doomsday Book in 1086. And in many ways, Englade is a celebration of English, British archeology, span um, An enormous amount of skill, energy, money has gone in um, over the last couple of centuries, but particularly over the last sort of 40 years or so in investigations into the English landscape. Uh, much of it, in development, uh, archaeology in advance of development. Um, but what hasn't happened quite as much um, as this enormous effort of, of field archaeology and analysis is, is attempts at synthesis. And this project is one of a number of projects um, which is starting to, to pull together what we know about the history of the English or, or often the British landscape to make use of this new richness of, of archaeological data, um, which can tell us um, an enormous amount. Um, could I have the next slide, please? An enormous amount about the, the development of the English landscape. This is a, uh, uh, an animation put together by Chris Green, which shows the amount that was discovered, the things that were discovered in different parts of England um, at the dates provided. So the 1840s at the moment, it'll go through to the present. So, so the English landscape was investigated for a long time, mainly by amateur um, archeologists, but then as the 19th and 20th centuries went on, 
professionalization happened of, of English archaeology. Um, and we gained our data from a whole range of different sources, from historic environment records, from English heritage, from the portable antiquities scheme, um, and the, um, the archaeology data service. Um, and this was a, an exercise in big data in some ways. I mean, archaeological data are quite small compared with, you know, medical data sets or whatever, but we amassed a, a database of, of approaching a million items from these various different sources. Um, and we played around with it, basically. What, what we didn't want to do was to attempt to provide a, a consistent, concerted narrative of the English landscape. Ours is a a first word rather than a last word. And one of the things we hope to have done is to provide the data or in, in provide various versions of the data to people generally so that others can play around with this data set. Um, if we could have the, the next slide, please, Chris. Um, and here, this shows you some of the, the major um, sources of the data. The project ran from um, August 2011 to July 2016. It was an ERC European Research Council funded project, which we were really um, grateful for, for the money. Um, and we investigated a series of themes, some of which will come up in the talks in a minute or two, identity, temporal patterning, morphology and definition of space, what we call landscape force, um, rather than determinism of landscape, relating data sets and, and mobility. Um, if we could have the next slide, please, Chris. Um, and these are the periods that we looked at, as I mentioned before, from the Middle Bronze Age through to the early medieval period. So we wanted to stray across conventional period boundaries to look at things that were different within those periods, but also threads of continuity that might join them. I have the next slide, please. Um, and these are um, the, the team, people who will talk to you, most of the people who will talk to you today. Um, Sarah Mallet, unfortunately, who's, who's towards the bottom there, won't be able to because she's gone to France to see her parents and show them her new baby, which is, uh, is a very good reason not to be here. Um, and Laura Morley was our research coordinator um, and, and um, full intellectual participant in the, in the project. Um, and Miranda Creswell, the, our, our project artist, you can see in the background um, a rendering of, of Danebury by Miranda. And, and again, Miranda, um, was very much part of the intellectual fabric of the, of the project. Um, and as well as the, the team participants, we had a great advisory board um, made up of John Blair, Richard Bradley, Barry Cunliffe, Mike Fulford, Helena Hammerow, Mark Pollard, Jeremy Taylor and Roger Thomas. And they provided lots of input and thought at various different times. Um, and I'd particularly like to thank Roger Thomas, who was who was very instrumental both in in constructing the original application and then in in providing us with with um, advice and information. And another person who isn't mentioned here is Roger Glide, who was a, a long term volunteer on the project. And Roger is an author in the book and is, um, is very much in the project. We can have the, the last slide, please. Chris. Um, this is again, this is, as, as Amy said at the beginning, we sort of combined art and science. So here's a, here's a clock which was sold for, for charity and um, on the right hand side of the clock is um, a bit of Chris Green's GIS work, which you'll hear a little bit more about on in a moment. And on the left hand side is, is one of Miranda's drawings um, around the theme of, of time and temporality. Um, we hope we've produced a lot, um, a lot of interest to people, but also importantly, I think we had fun. Um, we enjoyed experimenting with the data, with playing around with different ways of doing things, but also equally important, um, we enjoyed each other's company. 
and and the team has has continued as a team not that we've worked together but but people regularly see each other and interact and i think that's a a fantastic outcome of the project so so that's all for me um for now and i will hand over to to vicky donnelly to take us to the, the next step all right thank you chris um let me just share my screen i've just got a couple of slides not too many <laughs> So um, picking up from uh, what Chris is, has just launched us into with this discussion, um, I think I just wanted to say uh, a little bit about the experience of working on a big data project in archaeology. Um, uh, there's kind of two main points to that. Um, the first is just um, the data itself. Um, it was vast, immense, <laughs> very complex. Um, it was just a, a wide variety of data sets shared with the project. Um, and I'm sure, again, Chris has already outlined some of those sources and some of those partners who were very generous with their data to share with us. Um, but what was significant for me was that a huge amount of this data was produced by development-led um, or commercial archaeology. And so that slide Chris had just shown um, previously, the animated slide showing the impact of um, develop, mainly development-led commercial archaeological work uh, across England, uh, I think is absolutely stunning. And I think, um, I think it's nice at this point in time to take a moment to really celebrate uh, PBG 16, which was the, the major policy um, which drove um, that huge explosion you see from 1990 onwards in terms of the archaeological data that's, that's being produced. Um, and of course, these days, PBG 16 is now superseded by various other new pieces of legislation and PPF. Um, and other things, but it still has this very pivotal role um, from 1990 to 2010, which I think, you know, is incredible and, and should be remembered. Um, so when we're thinking about um, this kind of data that we used on the project, so much of it was from development-led archaeology. And again, I think I think that's amazing. I think development-led archaeology um is is a huge um producer of all of this data so it's really revolutionizing our understanding of the past and it's interesting because the, the distribution is actually driven by modern development so we're building our roads our houses our airports our wind farms um, and it's not always somewhere that archaeologists would have necessarily chosen themselves to, to look. Um, not have anything against those areas in particular, but, but maybe they weren't thinking it could be of interest. And of course, um, what we're finding is that there's evidence of the past almost everywhere. And um, what's very interesting is places where we don't see the past, if you like, so so the CUNY or, or areas of, of negative evidence, um, but also areas where we weren't expecting to see things, and it turns out um, there is something there. Um, so I think also as part of that sort of celebrating development-led archaeology, I would also like to, to center for just a moment before we move on to the rest of the project, just the very humble gray literature report. Um, and I think this is something that in the past, it, it's often maligned so that this is the reporting that's produced at the end of a development-led excavation. It's a, it's a kind of short formal summary report. Um, and yet it's also the source of so much of this data and, and information that we've been using. So, um, you know, it's often maligned. It's often thought to be of low quality, sort of a stereotype of the, the gray literature report. 
And so I think a better framing and a better question is perhaps to consider how effective is a grey literature report. Um, and I think to ask ourselves, can we use it as a tool for archaeological synthesis? Um, and I mean, I think this is something that we've shown um, can happen. Um, it's not without its difficulties. And uh, I'm sure Anwen and Chris and others will, will speak more on the idea of characterful data. But, um, you know, there's a lot of amazing work being done, has been done in the past, continues to be done um, by the Archaeology Data Service, the OASIS team, and maintaining and producing the Grey Literature Library that we currently have, which is incredible. Um, and this additional work captured by um, the Historic Environment Record officers, by the Local Planning Authority archaeologists, by Historic England, by all of these commercial development led archaeology companies is a huge cast of characters that are working very hard to make uh, basically the, the great literature that we're producing better and more effective. Um, and I think we should be really um, proud of that as a, as a profession, I think, collectively and very excited about projects like Englade that take that data and move it forward. So I think that's a very, very positive thing. Um, and I guess my final point <laughs> was just to talk about the experience of being a DPhil on the project, being a student as part of the team. So um, this is the three students, the three of us together. We all started at the same time um, and obviously uh, progressed through the project together. Um, and it was just a fantastic experience. It was amazing. Um, I think in archaeology, uh, frequently, perhaps in the more humanities end, the idea of doing your PhD or your doctoral research is that you're, you're a lone wolf, you're on your own, you check in with your supervisor, but you're, you're very much isolated. And it was a very different experience um, for me on this project. It was a very supportive and collaborative group um, guided by Chris Gosden at all times uh, into to doing some really interesting and, as he was saying, experimental thinking. Um, the whole team was fantastic. Everybody got involved. Everyone was very helpful and supportive of the students. Um, having Miranda on the project, I just specifically want to really highlight that Miranda was amazing and um, the opportunity to work with an artist in this kind of research setting was fantastic and uh, I very much enjoyed that. <laughs> so I think um, the next, our next speaker is going to be Letty, who's going to bring us into, uh, I think, a bit more of the early medieval side of the project. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Vicky. I think I have to uh, echo your uh, sentiments with uh, regards to the uh, team aspects of the Inglate project. It was a fantastic five years. Um, but uh, that's not what I want to be talking about now. I want to say a few words on what Inglate has done for the early medieval period and vice versa. Uh, I was the early medieval researcher on the project, although I think it has to be emphasized that all of us uh, were working across period boundaries. Uh, because one of our aims as well was to challenge the notion of traditional period boundaries and what they um, envisaged. Um, but in thinking about what uh, the relevance for the Inglate project was for the early medieval period and vice versa, I want to focus specifically on a few challenges that we encountered, which include the scale of the data, the granularity of the data. We had some discussions about good or bad data. Can you talk about it in such terms? And also very pertinent to an early medievalist, the question what to do about interdisciplinarity. And here, I mean, the wealth of linguistic and historical data that we also have for the early medieval period, but not, or not really for earlier periods. So um, starting, oh, sorry, uh, starting with um, uh, 
A bit more on the early medieval period, as Chris said, we define this as roughly the uh, 410 AD until 1086, so the end of Roman rule to the uh, period of the Norman conquests. Now, I've given you here a few uh, citations from early medieval people on this period themselves, uh, just to give you, um, to highlight a few points that I think they illustrate. First of all, I think they, they illustrate the challenges of interdisciplinarity. I think very strongly that we can't ignore this type of material, but I think it's resulted in a very different mindset uh, that early medievalists have and a set of theories as well, compared to especially prehistoric colleagues. I also think it illustrates the relevance of the early medieval period and the interest of this period from an identity perspective and the kind of mechanics and drivers of change that we often talk about in terms of identities. And finally, slightly more tongue in cheek, I think it illustrates that at a time almost nobody likes change. Now, going back to um, the challenges of granularity and scale. I think medieval landscape archaeologists are used to working on a very fine grained and relatively small scale to make use of the uh, wide range and variety of data we have at our disposal. But we worked on a very large coarse, gra coarse grained scale. Uh, most data repositories that fed into our database, such as HTRs and the Historic England National Monument Record. Uh, extract data from the grey literature that Vicky mentioned and do this on quite a coarse grained level. Most data is only recorded as early medieval rather than early Saxon, mid Saxon, etc. So this requires a different mindset. But I think once we had achieved this, we saw time after time that the early medieval period actually seemed quite different from earlier time periods, which was one of the main um, discoveries of the Inlay team. Now, this example I show here is from uh, Sarah Mellet's um, isotope work, Sarah, who can't be here today, showing the most marked change in both carbon and nitrogen uh, isotopes in humans, uh, taking place at some time between the early and middle Saxon periods. Um, not at the end of the Roman period, but in the course of the early medieval periods, which can be explained possibly by differences in diets, uh, an increased amount of fish consumption, which could be partially influenced by the increased importance of Christian um, ways of thinking, or possibly also differences in manuring uh, or the long-term cumulative effects of manuring practices. So different mindsets, different practices, keep that in mind. Um, a different aspect of the project we looked at uh, was mapping archaeological sites and archaeological features from our database. Now, one element I want to focus on here is mapping enclosure. We looked at the occurrence of different types of land divisions, field systems, enclosed settlements, enclosures across different case studies in Britain, in England, sorry. And although the regional trajectories of enclosure and the prevalence of them is very different, all regions had one thing in common, and that was that the early medieval period saw the lowest amount of uh, these enclosed features being recorded, either ever or since the Bronze Age. Now, of course, we all know that the early medieval sees very widespread reuse of older boundaries, which um, are often seen as clear evidence of continuity. But I think, or we think, that we should think about these, these things in slightly more complex terms. Continuity of place is not the same as continuity of practice. Or in other words, reusing an existing boundary uh, is not the same as gathering the manpower and the physical resources to construct one. Practices are very important. Now keep that in mind again. This brings me to the next challenge as well, which is what to do with documentary and linguistic data. As I said, I think we can't just ignore it, but taking the detailed approach that was common in early medieval archeology span uh, doesn't work on the scale of Inglaid either. And I think we struggled some, somewhat with this until uh, an interesting approach emerged when we took one step back and started asking what practices did writing actually serve in the, in the early medieval period? Now, in the case of a large amount of the sources at our disposal for this period, such as charters and uh, charter boundary clauses, the act itself was the act of demarcating, appropriating, and closing space using, in this case, uh, existing or natural features in the landscape. 
And uh, like the construction of physical boundaries in the landscape, as was more common in the uh, earlier Roman and Iron Age practices, these also are thought to have been enacted and ritualized community practices. So again, we see that uh, similar uh, concern with practice, with um, um, ownership of land issues, although uh, enacted in a very different way. And this brings me to the last uh, point I want to make, which is the uh, use of linguistic data. Now, place names are widely studied by early medieval archaeologists. Um, the most common type of place name, and for that reason, probably the least studied type of place name in Doomsday Book, combine, combines a personal name with an indicator of some kind of settlement. They're not often studied in as much detail as the more interesting place names, but their significance is nevertheless enormous because it shows a very uh, strong association between people and place, similar to, um, for example, the organization of Doomsday Book, where uh, land uh, holdings are organized by a landowner. Uh, similar concern with the appropriation of land that uh, I mentioned earlier in different contexts. So I think for me, in conclusion, what I think the early medieval period did for Inglate was to really help us focus on practice instead of pattern and to be a bit more open to the complexity of human behavior in this context. And vice versa, what I think Inglate did for the early medieval period was to show its difference. Um, people did things differently to some degree, either because they inherited the more complex landscape or because the church brought with it a whole new mindset. Who knows? But underneath these differences, there were also continuities or perhaps recurrent themes, uh, ritualized aspects of enclosures, for example, or the importance of land as commodity. Um, various things that we also had great fun exploring with uh, during the project uh, across the different periods. And I think that's where I'm going to end and hand over to my Romanist colleague or former Romanist uh, colleague, Tyler Franconi. Tyler. Thank you, Letty. Right. Well, I'll start by echoing my colleagues' uh, uh, statements of, of remembering this project so fondly and how nice it is to see everybody again to be thinking about Inglade again as the book is published and, and finally out there in the world. Um, I was very fortunate to join the project, um, not at the beginning, as many of the rest did, but about halfway through um, as the Romanist um, taking over for Zina Kamash when she, she left for other opportunities. Um, and so for me, um, Inglade was really uh, a project that required a lot, of, a lot of jumping right in and learning very quickly um, and, and learning a lot. Um, and I think in the years since, this project has been so foundational for the way that I continue to think about the Roman world. So um, I've been very grateful ever since for that experience. Now, what I wanted to say today was really going to focus on, on, on sort of two, maybe three themes um, that, that really stand out to me about what this project, um, how this project related to studying the Roman Empire more generally. So I just wanted to offer a few perspectives from and for the rest of the Roman world. And I'll frame these around first, what have the Romans ever done for us? Um, and a really remarkable thing that, that the English Landscapes Project um, emphasized kind of inadvertently, I think, but when we, when we looked at all of these data um, over this enormous amount of time, we found that the Roman period really stood out, um, it, it, certainly in quantitative numbers. Now, of course, Roman stuff is pretty visible. It's pretty durable. It sticks around. Archaeologists like to find it and talk about it. But I think that when we get to the point that some 40% of our data set um, comes from the Roman period, which is only 14% of the time span of the project, um, it really gives us some insight into what the scale um, of the impact of imperial incorporation really was on this province, on, on, on England under Roman rule. Um, and for better or for worse, right? This isn't really a judgment call. It's just simply a statement of there's a lot of Roman stuff. And we can look at that very clearly here and talk about it actually in numeric terms, which is fantastic. 
Um, and it's really unparalleled elsewhere in the Roman world. And so it's something that I think we should be thinking about um, anybody working elsewhere or continuing to work in Britain um, to think about Rome as a point in time on a much larger time span. That's not something Romanists are very good at, I admit. Um, but to really recognize how strange it actually can be. Uh, and I think that, that that's a really that's a really important thing, um, both that Roman studies may be brought into this, but also that Roman studies can take away from it as well. Um, and the second topic that I really wanted to take a look at um, was the importance of using data of this sort to be able to move between scales of investigation. Um, I know that this is something that, 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 that others are going to talk about today and is certainly discussed extensively in the book. Um, but I wanted to just show a very brief case study, which stems from the environmental research that was involved in the project, um, what Chris referred to as, as landscape force earlier, um, which was really trying to look at the relationship between environment and society um, over a very long term. And whether or not we can identify moments um, or larger trends of environmental determinism or on the other end of the spectrum, social determinism of the environment. And so one of the things that we did was we looked at um, the way that waterways um, here illustrated the Thames River Basin in southern England, um, the way that these watery landscapes helped structure life. Um, and so what you see here on this very colorful map uh, is, a, is a depiction of the Thames River Basin. So, you know, here's, um, here's the sea, here's London, the waterway goes up here, Oxford. But it's divided into dry zones in the sort of oranges brown and floodplains in blue. Um, flooding, of course, something that's very familiar to all of us that have ever lived alongside the Thames. Uh, and if we look back through time, it, it, it's a really interesting thing to see how people in the past have experienced and have interacted with these same landscapes. Um, and so one of the things that we did uh, to look at this question was to see, well, when and where are people actually living or building on floodplains and when are they not? And again, this is a place that the Roman period really stands out. Because previously, in the prehistoric period, um, most archaeological data relating to human activity in this zone really do fall on dry land away from the flood zones. But in the Roman period, we really see um, a lot of encroachment into these wetter landscapes. Uh, now, a big part of that is obviously the foundation of London, right in the middle of a major flood zone, but also a lot of other kinds of activity as well. And so when you zoom in on what exactly it is that Romans are doing, on floodplains or are not, you see that there seems to be a pretty close attention to, to intentionally not living on them, right? So things like villas and farms tend to be relegated more to dry land. And I think that that's probably not by mistake, but rather is quite intentional. Um, because when you look at the Roman remains that actually do fall within flood zones, you tend to find, you tend to find things like the site at Gill Mill, um, a gravel quarry excavation overseen by Oxford Archaeology for quite a long time and very recently published uh, quite extensively. But Gill Mill is a, one of the things that it preserves is a Roman period um, cattle farm, more or less, that really is in existence over the second and third centuries and shows a very specific way of managing wetland resources, of living in a floodplain and making the most out of, uh, out of the situation it provides and also um, helping to shape it a bit as well. Cows don't mind standing in wet land, not the same way that others do. Um, and so these landscapes were really utilized um, and, and they acted as parts of society, right? They didn't necessarily force society, um, but rather the end result that we see in the archeological record really shows a, a, a relationship between them that develops through time and through space. Um, and so moving from the regional basin viewpoint down to the individual site is a really valuable way to investigate some of these big questions like landscape relationships. And so if we turn my first question around and say, well, what have we ever done for the Romans, we here being Inglade? Um, I think a few things. And uh, I think that these are really important contributions that the rest of the Roman world should really contend with now. 
And first and foremost, um, as, as Vicky has said, as, as, been, as all of us are going to say, is the immense contribution that developer-led archaeology has to make um, to historical questions. Um, so much of Roman archaeology has for a very long time focused on, on what we might call academic excavation in the Mediterranean. Um, but the enormous wealth of data outside of that tradition now has to be a shaping factor in the way that the field moves forward. Um, and for this, England provides an excellent example to see how it can work, right? And really illustrates, I think, both what I've just been trying, what I've been saying here today, the importance of putting the Roman period within a much larger chronological span to understand its impact, the impact of empire, but also to recognize how strange, or maybe in some areas, how typical that experience may have been. And then finally, the importance of moving across scales and being able to investigate not just individual sites, but put them together into larger um, systematic investigations. And so um, I hope that my colleagues out there in Roman archeology span will take, will take this book and really, and really try to contend with what it has to offer um, because it's a really unique viewpoint and one that I think has a lot of value to a lot of people. Um, even well outside English landscape archaeology. It certainly had a major impact on the way that I think about it. And so I'm very grateful to all of you once again um, for that experience and helping shape that viewpoint. So that's what I'll end with. Um, thank you very much for listening to that. And I will now turn it over to Dan Stansby uh, to tell us a bit about his perspective. Thanks, Tyler. Um, I'll now attempt to share my screen. I hope that, that works. So, so uh, my my remit really was for um, ceramics and serving initially, and it sort of morphed into a project about food and ceramics and uh, I ended up writing a chapter with our colleague Sarah Malley who, who as we know can't be here today um, on that that part of the project and on, on her, her part was isotopes um, so to continue a theme I thought I'd, I'd also talk about three broad things and um, grouped under the under the heading of what Inglade has, has done for our understanding of diet and the material culture of food um, and I think in terms of our key results from, from food, pottery and isotopes, uh, in, and in terms of diet, paleoenvironmental evidence and ceramics, we were able to so, show certain continuities and discontinuities uh, in food and the material culture of food um, at a regional level, which run across the, um, the period, traditional period boundaries of, of later prehistory, the Roman period and the early medieval period. Um, so, for, for example, uh, we were able to show that in Kent, certain parts of late prehistoric Kent was a stronger preference for emma wheat um, when compared to a greater preference for spelt wheat in the Thames Valley. And that persisted in a, in a slightly diluted form into the Roman period. Um, also, there was a greater emphasis of, on wild animals um, in certain parts of Kent when contrasted with the Thames Valley. And that was something that we could see through later prehistory continuing into the Roman period and then on actually into the early medieval period. Um, in contrast to that, in slight contrast to that, variations in um, pottery seem to be linked to changes in the proportion of eating and drinking vessels as opposed to the proportion of cooking vessels in, in, in regional assemblages. Um, and so we we're able to show that there was a, a stronger emphasis on drinking vessels in the southeast, again, right through the late, pre late prehistory uh, Roman period and the early medieval period. Um, whereas in the Upper Thames Valley, there was more of an emphasis amongst the, uh, amongst the eating and drinking vessels on uh, bowls, which perhaps were used for, for communal serving of food. Um, and I did, I briefly talked to, to Sarah about what she might've wanted to say um, about her part of her work. And um, she, she said, that she wanted me to emphasize how isotopes allow us to get into human landscape relationships by enable, enabling us to look at um, environmental factors. So that was a kind of really brief um, summary of her 
her work, which I'm not really qualified to, uh, to, to talk about. Um, and the second element that I wanted to, 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 to talk about was the methodological influence that Inglade has had on um, developer funded archaeology. And uh, I think we're now starting to see, although there's been a long term uh, emphasis on data sharing and developing shared database, I think there's been a direct influence of our project and also the, the Roman rural settlement project, which happened at the same time as Inglade uh, on developer funded archaeology in the UK. Uh, and particularly on the HS2 railway project, which um, is starting to ask us to think about how we standardise our finds data and how we record that in a way that can be shared amongst researchers and other developer funded archaeologists. And, and I think that's a really important legacy of the kind of thinking about scale that we did and which other big data projects which were happening at the same time also did. Um, and then personally to, to, to echo what other people have been saying, um, I found that the experience of being part of the Inglade project was a really pleasant mid-career skills reboot. Um, and I gained lots of new skills around different kinds of GIS software and uh, database software, new academic knowledge, new ways of theoretical thinking. But I think really importantly as uh, someone who's gone back into developer funded archaeology. It really reset my way of thinking about um, that process from a one of writing up reports on sites um, to one of creating data sets and um, digital data that could be used to, to, to spur research. Um, and obviously, the Inglade team and my colleagues were an enormously important part of that and it was a really uh, wonderful four years for me. So I think with that, I will hand you over to Chris Green, um, who is a GIS wizard and was the GIS wizard on the Inglade project and um, is now, um, I believe, still doing his GIS wizarding in um, in other, other parts of the School of Archaeology. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm still uh, doing other GIS things in the department, including some of the finishing off things for this project. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah, my position was basically as the postdoc who sort of looked at the spatial elements of the project and I sort of inherited the database at one point as well. So ended up being responsible for most of the sort of major data things, I suppose. Um, and also for, I mean, everybody did a lot of their own spatial analysis as well, but obviously it's a lot of that uh, was in collaboration with myself because I've done more of it than anyone else, obviously. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to, this will be quite a brief one. I just wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the way the project operated more than results. Um, Chris touched on this at the start, but I think it was quite a modern project in the sense that it was it was very much data driven. It's like we didn't, I mean, there, um, there were some sort of hypotheses and things floating around in the background, but they weren't really the way in which the project was structured and that sort of conventional scientific method thing that is increasingly uh, less applied in a lot of the sciences because uh, you risk missing important things if you just look for things you're already interested in before the project starts, if you know what I mean. Um, so we operated in this way, I would argue, where we collected all of this data, however you want to count it, um, and then we tried to understand the character of that data and the various things that sort of structure it or bias it depending on your perspective um, and then so on some ways so where the explored the data and experimented with the data to see where it could lead us to um, the maps on the screen are just a couple of examples of things that we did um, the one at the top left is just a model of potential for archaeology to have been discovered in the UK, in England rather um, and that's very much just an ad hoc model and we've done more 
sophisticated statistical things with that sort of concept since the project, um, but I haven't got any of that here because it's not in the book. Um, and the other map is just a, a map of how visible the landscape is across England, um, which is a, a GIS model that I constructed, which if you'd done it in a conventional way would have been very computationally intensive, but I worked out a method that sort of shortcut some of those uh, processing elements. Um, and I put it in because it's pretty basically. Uh, and then the other thing I just wanted to talk about was the sort of centralness of visualization to the project. Um, we, we operated in a very visual manner. I mean, that partly also applies to working with Miranda, of course. Um, and there was a lot, I made a lot of graphs, some of which made it into the book, some of which didn't. Everyone made a lot of graphs, but you know, um, and lots of maps and all different ways of visualizing data and coming up with new methods um, and applying different techniques in some places or just sort of the sort of uh, blunt instrument method of applying the same technique with a script and so you can apply it to lots of different things without having to do it all manually. Um, these are just a couple of visualizations on the screen. I think Anwen might mention the one at the top right, so I won't bother talking about that. Uh, the one at the bottom left is uh, for one of the field systems that we looked at. We um, uh, calculated the astronomical or celestial declination of the lines of the field system, uh, like the board of the boundary lines of all the different between all the different fields, basically. And you can see in this particular case, that field system is very clearly focused on midwinter sunrise and slightly less focused on midsummer sunset, um, which are opposite each other in the sky, but because of the undulating nature of the landscape aren't necessarily opposite each other on the ground, if you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, just, Visualization. And then finally, like everyone else, I just wanted to make a note of how much fun it was working with everybody. Uh, this is one of Miranda's artworks at the bottom left, uh, looking at um, one of the relatively early project meetings, I think, where she was documenting a lot of our methods and then trying to create some uh, artworks based on that. This one effectively shows lots of people staring at maps and documents printed off in one of our team meetings. Uh, and then the other pictures are just of various trips and things we took, including Letty scaling the Theodosian walls of uh, Constantinople at the bottom right, which I like. She was the only one of us who was brave enough to go up that very, very steep staircase. <laughs> of those of us who were there, I'm not, I'm not casting a, any disparagement on the courage of anyone who wasn't there. <laughs> anyway, um, so that was all I really wanted to say, nice and brief. So I will now hand over to Anwen Cooper who is now at the Cambridge Archaeological Unit. I'm still right, yeah. I think I've successfully shared my screen now. <laughs> okay, so uh, to start off, I'd like to echo what everybody else has said and say what a privilege it has been to work with everyone and how much I've learned from everyone else on the project. And I've even managed to develop a huge respect for all of my colleagues. And <laughs> it's, been, it's nice that we're still in touch. And in some cases, we're still working with each other too, which is great. Um, so following on from um, Letty's account of what Inglade did for the early medieval period and Tyler's account of what um, they've done for the Roman period, I'm going to look at um, what Inglade has done for prehistory and also what prehistory has done for Inglade. Um, and I wanted to revisit these questions today because I think now the monographs come together, the answers come across even more strongly um, than when we finished the project. So in each of my slides, I'm gonna highlight one thing I think that Inglade's done for prehistory, um, where you can see this effect in the monograph. So if you like, you can see these as tasters for the monograph. Um, and also other in Englade publications which um, showcase this work. And I think this makes the point that um, the monograph is really a starting point for exploring an array of wider project outputs, publications and online resources uh, by all of the Englade team. So to start with the question, what has pre-history done for Englade? 
Um, I could give you all sorts of answers to this question. However, I think one thing that prehistory did and that I'd like to emphasize and as demonstrated in this picture is that prehistoric people made things, earthworks, objects and so on that endured so that um, later people could engage with and interpret them. Ooh. So um, what has Inglay done for prehistory? Um, well, I think the first thing that Inglay done, has done for prehistory is to um, showcase previously underrepresented data sets on a national scale, um, but also do detailed regional work um, using recently excavated evidence. So in a sense, you could say that it's um, traverse scale, and I know this has come up already this afternoon. Um, and I think these two evidence sets you can see here, um, the lovely uh, prehistoric intertidal um, evidence from the Isle of Wight, um, we showcased on a national scale and um, the round barrows in the east of England, we looked at um, in, in a lot of detail um, in our study of barrow relationships. Um, and uh, these two evidence sets are showcased in chapter 10, um, which is about time. Um, but uh, the issue of traversing scale is in chapter nine, if you want to follow that up. Another thing um, which I think that Inglade has done for prehistory is contextualizing later prehistoric evidence. Um, and I think this is done really well, um, particularly by Chris Green and Chris Gosden in uh, chapter seven, um, where they look at fields. And fields are notoriously difficult to pin down in their chronology. They've mostly been studied in period specific boxes and at a regional level. Um, and I think that um, Chris Green and Chris Gosden both found it liberating um, and interpretively really interesting to look at them um, on a larger scale and over the longer term. Um, so on the left hand side here, we can see Middle Bronze Age fields being excavated um, in Berkshire by Wessex archeology, span um, period specific fields. And on the right, we can see Chris Green's model um, of Iron Age and Romano British fields um, from Wiltshire. And I think one thing that they were able to show was that um, it, it's well known that um, Middle Bronze Age fields are often on a northeast southwest alignment. Um, but when looked at, when you look at all the fields from across the whole of England that you can gather together, um, this patterning um, continues into the later periods as well. Um, so that's something that came across really nicely there. Another thing that we did was to revisit um, some key interpretive themes in prehistory. And I've got, I haven't got time to go into detail here, obviously, um, but I think one thing um, that we looked at and which crops up in all periods, really, not just in prehistory, is the idea of um, continuity and change. Um, and I think the main point to make here is that it's very easy to identify continuity when you look at landscapes, um, extensive landscape um, in, in England. Um, but when you examine these in much more detail, even the most repetitive and stable and consistent of um, archaeological entities, um, whether it's uh, post alignments in the intertidal zone on the Isle of Wight or round barrows or um, major early medieval earthworks, um, are much more mutable when you actually um, look at them in detail. Another thing that we did um, was to take ideas from different periods. And this is something that really come out of working together as a, as, as a diverse group. Um, so uh, one thing that Chris Green and I did, um, uh, did um, with me is um, that we took the idea of, Rome, of coin loss models, which have been used um, extensively in the Roman and early medieval periods. Um, Chris Green applied some of his um, fuzzy temporal magic um, to, the, to these data sets and we started to look at um, how we could go outside the sort of straitjacket of looking at um, Roman um, production periods and uh, start to compare different types of objects and um, the loss of different types of objects. So you can see here in the image on the right, we're comparing the loss of um, late Iron Age brooches with late Iron Age coins. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, I think um, that the, the most important thing that I think that Inglade's done for prehistory is um, to work at a scale that makes us think differently and to readjust our critical focus. And 
I think it's fair to say that all of us found it quite hard to work with such a lot of data and also to switch off our critical faculties or to put it differently, to um, switch off our tendencies to perfect data. Um, but in the end, I think we all embraced the characterful uh, nature of our data. And instead we turned our efforts to focus on um, using these data productively. And I think this is really important because firstly, um, it allowed us to work um, at a national scale in a way that um, isn't really done as much nowadays, unlike um, in the mid 20th century. Um, but also, and most importantly, it made us think differently. And I hope that that comes across in this book. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you all. So, um, yes, and in, in, I hope what you've gained here is some sense of, of the Englade project. Um, the Englade team and the, and, and the Englade dynamics. Um, we very much hope that you'll read the book and engage with it. And I don't want to end on a, in any way, a downbeat note, um, but archaeology in some ways at the moment is, is under degrees of threat. Um, there's new planning legislation going through. We don't know what that will be or what its implications will be for archaeology, but it could potentially be quite serious. Um, academic departments are being closed down um, at the same time as we're starting to realise and celebrate the true richness and, and variety of archaeological data. And we hope that these um, data that we've produced here, these arguments that we've produced here will, will provide interesting things about the English landscape, but also, as I said earlier on, I think has come out in all the talks, a celebration of archaeology in England and elsewhere in all its, all its variety. Uh, so thank you all very much for coming. We're, we're hoping that there might be some questions. Uh, it's probably quite hard to, there's, there's quite a lot of variety and different things to, to get your head around, but, but we're very in, in, excited and, and um, happy to, to entertain questions. So do, do please ask them either, either through the chat function or, or, um, or by waving some sort of virtual hand, but more, more particularly through the, the, the chat function. Uh, okay, yes, there's two, two questions. I'll, I'll take them in reverse order, as, as it were. Um, so Jessica Rawson has asked an absolutely key question, the contrast between the northwest and the southeast in our maps. Um, is it a chance or is it reality? Um, we very much think it is reality. Um, and, in 1923, Cyril Fox um, published a book called The Personality of Britain, where he pointed out this contrast. And in some ways, we spent two and a half million euros to prove Fox was Fox was right. But but what Fox came up with, so so Fox said there's a there's something of a line between the River X in the southwest and Whitby in the northeast. And, and on this side of the line, as it were, there's generally more settlements, more artifacts, more everything. And on the other side of the line, fewer artifacts, fewer, fewer um, settlements and so on. And, and his um, explanation for that was purely environmental, that it was colder, wetter, different geology and so on in the north and west than it was in the south and east. And there is some truth to that. But but we put quite a lot of effort into looking at the influence of, of topography and, and realised that, that in the southeast there are more sort of monotone landscapes, as it were, less obvious contrasts between um, high and low and, and um, different forms of environment, whereas the north and west have these very contrasting environments. So it's not that the north and west is more difficult per se, um, it's that it's more varied. And we thought that, that there were also a whole series of cultural, um, cultural questions and issues. People were using the landscape differently in a long-term way. Um, hard, to, hard to go into now exactly what we think that, that might be. Um, 
but um, but yeah, no, that's a, that's an extremely pertinent contrast. Sorry, sorry, Robin. I don't know. Um, yes, it, it, you, you said you were going to field the questions, and no, 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 that's that's fine. <laughs> um, so that yes, yeah, so we've got a we've got a and Jessica Jessica Rawson also says that James Hawes expanded on this in in um, in his book, um, which which we should all read. So Catherine Weikart says, um, congratulations. Um, oh, I love the scales that you've explored um, and can't wait to read the book. Oh, thank you. Um, and Catalin Pelinescu says, I do research into quantum identity. Wow. Okay, yes, um, that's, that's way beyond my pay grade to comment on. Um, and... Um, Michael Ledbetter at the, the bottom there, could you talk a little bit more about the issue of landscape force, which was briefly mentioned? Okay. Um, who would like to, but I shouldn't, shouldn't just be me, would somebody else like to, uh, like to take the question of landscape force? Everyone thought about it in various different ways. I can maybe start, Chris. Yeah, great. Um, so landscape force is kind of one phrase that maybe was used interchangeably with others to investigate the relationship between environment and society throughout the project. Um, and it was, as an investigative theme, it was meant to see how it was that people interacted with these landscapes. As Chris was just saying, going back to Fox in, in the 20s and, and talking about the way that topography may or may not have shaped experience. Um, we really expanded that out into different aspects I talked about water, but we talked about climate, ruggedness, all kinds of different things, food, agricultural landscapes. Um, and I think that the major point uh, that comes across in the book anyway, certainly in, in the, the environmental chapter, chapter four, is that there is no single relationship between people and the environment, and it is constantly changing through time and space. Um, and we really try to just emphasize that dynamism and highlight it through a series of case studies, um, none of which are meant to be taken as wholly representative of, of anything outside of those case studies, but rather to highlight the diversity of experience in the way that people have experienced um, the English landscape through time. Chris, I have a question, if I may. Yes. I'd like to bring Miranda in, if she doesn't object, mm -hmm. um, just to talk about having an artist on a project like this. That's a real rare opportunity. And I was wondering if there was ever any conflict between Miranda's art and vision and the data, or if it was complementary, or did it bias the influence of that? What effect that had? Um, well, I, I made a deliberate um, uh, uh, kind of focus on not not illustrating um, what was going on, but more almost like being someone in the field. Because a lot of it was uh, data driven, and it was quite quite interesting to go out and do long term drawings. Or by long term, I meant drawings that that for five days in one particular spot that was chosen by one of my colleagues on Inglade, and so that it was quite nice to have that that kind of difference between being in the field right there um, and talking to people and looking at the landscape and then kind of coming back and reporting back. And I, I felt that was quite interesting. Um, and I also was really interested in, in graphs and maps and talked about how to visualize things very effectively so that um, the information that was, was needed to be portrayed uh, was very immediate and at its most accurate because of the colours that were used and things like that. So, so I'm not quite sure how I'm answering that, that your question, Robin, <laughs> but that I kind of, I, I, but I wasn't illustrating um, kind of the Iron Age or something like that. <laughs> could, could I also, so, oh sorry Anwen, yes, yeah, so I'll just say very briefly, I mean having Miranda there was like having an extremely intelligent ethnographer with us. Uh, asking us about our customs and, and habits and why we did particular things, which which really sharpened up our, our arguments and our thought about the data in lots of lots of very germane ways. 
Sorry, Anne, when you I was going to say something similar, that Miranda was much more than the artist on the project. And uh, she came along to all our project meetings and was very much part of, of, of the team as a whole. And I think inspired us in lots of different ways. But um, but yes, she has a very critical um, uh, mind and and brought a whole new perspective to, to what we were doing, I think, um, a very visual perspective, but also um, from her, her literary knowledge, I would say. Um, and uh, also she documented what we did in our meetings um, very thoroughly and in interesting ways. And I think that's another important output that she yeah, contributed. Yeah, I'd like to say that it would be, I have, um, I have a, a, a small, you know, uh, library <laughs> of every, because one of the things that was interesting was that we decided very much at the beginning and in order to talk about one subject, uh, for that for their meeting is for Chris Green to print a map of whatever was going to be discussed a physical thing and put in the middle of the table and that little piece of paper had notes on it and etc and we've we've um we've kept all those with dates um so the future you know maybe something will happen with with this archive I don't, I'm not sure what but I felt it was important to keep <laughs> So thank you, Robin, for that question. <laughs> and some, a lot of it can be seen on the website for the project as well, um, as well as the visual blog that you have there too. Thank you. And sorry, just to say that Chris and Miranda are producing an atlas through which will be a, a school monograph, um, which will have their, their various works in it and in a sort of science arts collaboration, slight tension. Playing, playing with those different ways of visualization. So that will be an extremely important outcome of the project. With Letty and Zena as well. <laughs> yeah, everybody, everybody contributed to yeah. that. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Right, if we don't have any other questions, it just remains to thank everyone for attending today and sharing this with us. Um, there is a promotional code. If anyone is interested in getting the book, do go on Oxford University Press and we put details for that on the school website as well. You get 30% off. Um, thank you all so much for dialing in from your various places. This has been recorded and I will be uploading um, a file of that to the school's YouTube channel at some point next week. But in the meantime, thank you for helping us round off Trinity Town with such a great project roundup. And I wish you all a lovely sunny afternoon. And thank you, Robin, for organising this. It's been fantastic. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Cheers. <laughs>